Let's all take a deep breath in and out together. Before I offer my thoughts this morning, we wanted to share a brief video that sums up what we're talking about today. Dr. Silesh Rao is an expert in the systemic exploration of how we may all become climate healers. So that video from Climate Healers and the app United by Heart, which Don will show you later in the foyer if you're interested, was the inspiration for the service. And I'm really grateful to Don for asking me to address this topic of becoming a climate healer. I love the phrasing and the, the framing of the idea of being a climate healer. And I've learned so much and been encouraged and hope to inspire us all today to know that each one of us can be a climate healer in our own way. My friends, it's clear, abundantly clear, that we're in a climate emergency. And we simply can't ignore all that's been happening in our area right here and in the world from worsening drought to more fires, to hurricanes, heat waves and floods to realize that things are escalating quickly. Events that were a once in a lifetime now seem to be happening regularly. And this escalation can feel really scary when we think about our future. So how do we find hope that we can still reverse this climate emergency and that our actions can actually make a difference? How do we not give up and feel inspired to do our part? I know that's been on my mind and I'm guessing it might be on some of your minds as well. Now, last time I spoke on climate change, we explored regenerative farming and rewilding our planet as a vital solution to stemming climate change. But today I wanna to delve more deeply into the impact of animal agriculture, which Dr. Rao touched on in the video. To bring about change, we need to stop supporting a system that deforests our land to feed and uphold our massive animal agriculture system. Now, animal agriculture leads to the removal of our vital oxygen and moisture delivering forests and subsequent desertification of our planet and destroying forests, our beautiful forests to create fields for farming is actually turning large parts of our world into a giant dried out desert. You only need to look at the kind of the middle of our world, of our planet as more and more forests are being destroyed, they're turning into desert. And furthermore, I learned in a powerful movie called Eating Our Way to Extinction, which you may have seen in news and notes every week and is also listed in our order of service resources, that even fish farming is poisoning our oceans and leading to mass die off of fish and ocean flora. Not to mention, and I was horrified by this, all the toxic chemicals that are used to de-louse fish and clean them, which not only poison the fish, but then also likely poison those who eat them. And then of course there's the cruelty with which the animals are treated in the animal agriculture system. And when you really learn what's happening to the millions of animals, the conditions that they're subjected to, it's really hard to condone it if we're willing and wishing to be loving people, which I think our faith calls us to be. Remember the videos we watched earlier of farm animals loving and hugging and frolicking and being great friends to humans? If we got close to these animals in the same way that we do our beloved pets, and we learned their amazing capacity to feel, to mourn, to experience joy and connection, we might feel differently about them ending up on our plate. Like civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson talks about the importance of 
proximity in the fight to end racial injustice. Proximity to animals also changes our relationship to them and our sense of separation that we feel from them through the animal agriculture system. Dr. Silas Rao, who you saw in the video, he's an electrical engineer and a climate activist. He founded an inspiring movement and website called Climate Healers, and I encourage you to check it out. And he explains that over the last 6,000 years since deforestation began, land use change for animal agriculture has produced an inordinate amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And as we expand our consumption of animal foods, more and more forests and wild habitats are being destroyed. And if we continue on this trajectory, he warns, we may soon wipe out all the wild animals on this earth. All the wild animals. And according to the UN, the plan is to double livestock production by 2050. And farmed animals eat five times as much food as we do. And agriculture con constantly needs to clear more land to feed them. So he urges us to return land to their original forests that existed in the 1800s and remove the incentives and consumption habits that lead big business to destroy land. And my friends, before you ask, well, why is she talking about climate change here? This is not a political speech. I urge you to remember that climate change is a spiritual issue. Our seventh principle as Unitarian Universalists calls us to respect the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And an article in our current issue of UU World about eating as a spiritual practice reminds us that in 2011, Unitarian Universalists adopted a statement of conscience entitled Ethical Eating, Food and Environmental Justice, which explained that the current American food culture harms the environment, harms animals, and humanity, and fertilizers and overfarming, pesticides and factory processes and methane and fuel emissions pollute the air, water, and soil. Cows, pigs, and chickens are subject to sickening conditions in factory farms. This resolution from 2011 states. So remembering our connection to all living things and Saving our earth from climate disaster is one of the most spiritual things we can actually do because it's increasing our capacity to love and care for one another. Opening our hearts to other beings, be they human, plant, or animal, and seeing them as equally worthy increases our capacity to love and be whole human beings. Today is the start of the 27th United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Egypt, or COP27. At COP17 in 2011, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in South Africa insisted that while climate change is a symptom. The fever that our earth has contracted, the underlying disease is the disconnection from creation that plagues human societies throughout our earth. We need to heal that disconnection by promoting and exemplifying compassion for all creation in all our actions. The UN said in 2011, when what we do and say is not in alignment, we suffer and we cause suffering to others. My beloveds, we've been entrusted this extraordinary planet to live on and live off. And I think you might agree with me, it's beyond beautiful and nourishing. It's awe-inspiring and life-giving. It feeds our bodies and spirits. 
Have you ever met anyone who wasn't uplifted by spending time out in nature? Thank you, Tom. The natural world gives to us unconditionally. It loves us into wholeness, whether or not we reciprocate. So as we look at our mountains and our oceans and our trees and plants and animals and think of the array of sentient beings in our world, I ask you to breathe in what being nature, being out in nature does for your spirit. Does it uplift them? Does it? And now imagine a world without that. A world without the amazing biodiversity of animals, a world without green space, forests, and lush environments, a world without oceans teeming with fish and coral reefs, a world without fresh water or glaciers or miles of rambling coastland, a world that is stark, harsh, dried out and dangerously hot. I'm not sure I would want to live in a world in which the lungs of our earth, like the Amazon rainforest, our heart of well-being have been removed. My friends, we are on the precipice of losing what we love. We are on the verge of destroying this incredible gift we've been given through the choices that we make as individuals as governments, as corporations, as nations. And I know it can feel overwhelming knowing what to do. And I was actually speaking to some young people the other day who felt despair about what we can do to stem climate change. They felt we'd gone too far and that nothing we could do now would actually make a difference. And I'm here today to tell you that according to the science, we can still make a difference if we act now. If we act now. And so I want to focus on how each one of us can be a climate healer. Actions matter, my friends, and so does inaction. So one of the most important things you can do this week alone is to go out and vote. Persuade others to vote and help people get to the polls, if we can make sure that people who believe in addressing the climate emergency get into power, we can help in a systemic way. So vote. And there are also many personal habits that we can change. One of the most impactful ones is to reduce our dependence on animal agriculture. And you might wish to join the UU Animal Ministry, which is focused on compassion for all beings. And also the United by Heart app, which we saw on the video earlier, and you can get on your phones for free, has lots of ideas of how you can become less reliant on meat in your diet. And if more and more of us eat more plant-based diets and less meat, we can actually make a significant dent in the demand for animals. And heck, if you're able to, become vegan, as this has a huge impact on your, and we've got a few passionate vegans in the room here, <laughs> has a huge impact on your personal carbon footprint. And Don is going to be in the foyer after the service to show you the app and share more resources. And they're also on our order of service, which you received by email this morning. Now, I, I want to be honest with you. Personally, I really struggled with the idea of becoming vegan because um, I actually really want to be in integrity about what I preach about. I want more than anything to be vegan ideologically and to make a difference like this on the planet. And in fact, I was vegetarian for seven years when I first became a UU. But unfortunately, due to a significant illness that I suffered a few years ago, I'm not able to digest grains or beans or starches which makes being vegan really hard for me, as you can imagine. It doesn't really leave much except tofu. And yeah, so. <laughs> and I'm really sad about that. But I'm committed to not eating beef, to not eating pork or fish, 
and will only rarely eat chicken or turkey. And when I can, I only eat humanely raised fowl. And I can't wait for them to successfully create laboratory grown meat. So there's gonna be no more need to eat animals of any kind. And this is so hard for me because I really want to do this ideologically. But if your health is not impacted by going vegan, you might try doing this a few times a week. And the UU Animal Ministry suggests a meatless Monday. So anything helps. And that's what I'm committed to, to eating vegan at least three times a week. Author and futurist William McCaskill writes, some personal consumption decisions have a much greater impact than reusing plastic bags. By going vegetarian, you avert around 0.8 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. And this is a big deal, he says. It's about one-tenth of my total carbon footprint. And over the course of 80 years, I would avert around 64 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. George Monbiot, a UK journalist and environmental activist, says, we need systemic change even more than incremental change. And so he cautions us not to get hung up on incremental change, like using paper straws or getting rid of plastic bags, but rather look at working on the bigger systemic change that we can influence. He says, looking at it from the global perspective, as a whole, it's now important to stop animal agriculture as it is to leave fossil fuels in the ground. He says, we've just got to stop eating animals because that's the primary environmental driver of destruction. Agriculture as a whole is the major cause of habitat loss, he writes, the major cause of wildlife loss, the major cause of extinction, the major cause of land use, the major cause of freshwater use, of soil degradation, and one of the major causes of climate breakdown, of water pollution and of air pollution. An example of a great solution that he offers is something called precision fermentation, where protein-rich foods can be grown from single-celled organisms, from microbes. And this reduces the environmental impact of producing protein-rich foods and doesn't need fertile land or water. And I can't wait for science to develop faster and faster so that we can do that. And another way of helping to bring about more systemic changes to keep advocating for legislation and influence our law lawmakers. Join the Citizens Climate Lobby and our Chalice Climate Action Team. Advocate for schools to make their meals more plant-based. Anywhere where food is served en masse could be a place of influence. And in addition to switching to plant-based diet, other important individual actions that we can take to become climate healers is to drive less or drive electric, which may many of you I know here at Chalice are already doing, thank you. And then we can fly less and become more energy efficient by insulating our home, particularly our attic, and put solar panels on our house if we can. And if you live in condos or apartments, you're already helping by sharing resources and using less energy than individual homes do. And of course, as we talked about earlier, we vote with our dollars and our actions. We either support harm or suffering to animals in the planet, or we support companies and products that have reverence for animals, for life, and for our earth. And as thoughtful spiritual beings, I encourage us to choose wisely. But unfortunately, individual actions alone make up a statistically insignificant impact on overall global emissions. And according to scientist and author Bill McKibben, climate change is actually a math problem. And the numbers are really, really big. And now the timelines are very, very tight. So he says we have to be thinking in terms of our greatest leverage to get the biggest reduction possible. I listened to a podcast this week called How to Save a Planet, and I commend it to you. 
And this particular one was about whether our individual actions really can make a difference. And the conclusion seemed to be that if we think of our individual action as a form of communication, messaging that invites others to join us, then they can actually lead to systemic change. Just think of Greta Thunberg and how much her individual actions, a, a simple schoolgirl, her actions in communication has dramatically impacted the world. So talking about our choices, why we make them makes a difference and not remaining silent about this subject for fear someone might think differently from us is really key. It's the hundredth monkey effect, a ripple effect. But most importantly, my friends, we should not be shaming or guilting people if they're not doing it the way we are. Instead, help them discern what they might want to do. And remember how powerful we can be if we act together and all do our individual part. Think about where you can be most useful as an individual in this struggle. Where are you called to change? What can you bring to the table through your sphere of influence? What will you focus on and what brings you joy? This podcast suggested creating a Venn diagram and in the to top circle, you write what brings you joy. And I invite you to think about that for a moment. What brings you joy in life? And then in the next circle, you write what you are good at what you're good at. And then you explore in the other circle what climate solutions you want to work on. And once you've drawn this, what brings you joy, what you're good at, and what climate solutions you want to work on, you look at the overlapping part in the Venn diagram from these different circles. And my diagram shows me why I'm so grateful to be a minister because I get to share my passion for growth, for healing, for spreading love with my love for our planet and creating and growing community. I invite you to grow, to create your own Venn diagram and brainstorm with one another. You might want to do that in our social hour afterwards. Where do you feel inspired to be a climate leader? And remember, your individual actions matter if they inspire ripple and affect larger groups. And then collective transformation can lead to what the Dr. Silesh Rao says, calls the great transition, which is a global spiritual and cultural transformation of values. And wouldn't we all like to see that? Wouldn't we? A global transformation of values. He likens us all to a caterpillar and that we are currently blind consumers eating everything around us. And when the caterpillar becomes too big, it stops and builds a cocoon around itself. Essentially, it meditates for a week. And you're going to see caterpillars appearing, cocoons appearing on our change installation there during the month. And when the caterpillar has changed and grown enough within its cocoon and imaginal cells are born that allow it to develop into a new building, a new being rather. <laughs> Perhaps we're entering that cocoon as a society now and we're building beautiful, eco-friendly buildings. And I invite you to imagine that new future. And from that cocoon, when the butterfly emerges, she is reborn into a beautiful creature that regenerates life. And I hope and pray for us that we are in a similar process of transformation. So to help transform, my friends, I invite you to join us at our upcoming community forum called Love Our Water on Saturday, November 19th. There's going to be storytelling and acorn planting, 
and grilled Beyond Beef plant-based burgers and so much more. And the same day is also World Food Healers Day, which is the day after the COP27 climate conference ends. And they have a goal to make 1 billion free vegan meals for people all over the world that day. Isn't that amazing? You can sign up for that on Climate Healers. So what else can we do as a community? And I know we're going a little long today, but I hope you'll bear with me. This message is so important. We may wish to revive our mindful eating group. We can support local plant-based restaurants like the Restaurant Sage, for example, which is a farm to table restaurant in Agoura Hill. We can visit the gentle barn that we raised money for and get to know the amazing animals that have been rescued from the animal agriculture system. And we can keep rewilding any land that you can by planting your own vegetables and trees. I see some of you here who do that passionately. We can use an app like United by Heart. And I discovered a new search engine that we can use called Ecosia, which, which plants trees every time you do a search. So why not use that rather than Google, you know? Ecosia, E-C-O-S-I-A. My friends, there's so much that we can do individually and collectively. We can make a difference. Each of us can spread the word and be a climate healer. All it takes is a choice to find your part and commit to that. Dr. Silesh Rao sums it up in this way. Eat plants, plant trees, love life and heal the planet. Or if you want it in the form of an acronym, a word that's spelled help, heal the planet, eat plants, love life, and plant trees. May it be so. <laughs>